What I'd like to do is just go over the essential elements of self-storage from developing the business through construction. And we're going to go over the concepts and there's additional information on some of the slides that you may want to come back to when you have a little bit more time to look at them in depth. But I'd like to give you an overall look of self-storage. The reason that we wanted to do this presentation for you today is that the Param Group has been to many, many trade shows. And some of them have up to 4,000 people and 100 vendors. And people who are new to the industry have gone through trade shows and tried to gather information from a lot of different sources. And they'll come up to us at some point during the day and say, I just don't know where to start. And they have that glazed over look in their eyes. And what we wanted to do was try and help that deer in the headlights look just a little bit because we know it can be confusing and we want to give you answers to some of the questions that we have heard. We want to start and do it in an organized manner, trying to give you an overall view of getting into self-storage from A to Z. The way we want to present this is uh, we'll go through what the owner does, what the developer does, what the financer does, and the manager does. And we're going to start with the owner, and there are three basic questions. What do I need to know? Who can I get to help me? And how will we interact with each other? The first thing that an owner needs to know are just some of the basic fundamentals of self-storage that is different from other businesses. And the first thing you have to understand about self-storage is that although people get into it for many different reasons, looking for many different things, Self-storage is a business, just like every other business, and it has to be evaluated that way. The other thing that's kind of unique about self-storage is that people will only rent what they really need. That means that you can't create a need for something through advertising or any other means. You know, if you have uh, a special food item to or, uh, promote, you can do an advertising campaign or whatever. But if a person's garage is empty, there is nothing that you can say or do that is going to get them to go out and rent a space when they don't have anything to put in it. So it has to be an actual need that the people have in order to make a self-storage business viable in any particular area. The other thing that you need to always have in the back of your mind is that the only thing that you actually have to sell is airspace. There is no product other than airspace. And you can package that airspace in different ways by having a different exterior and different unit sizes. But the bottom line is that all you've got is airspace. And because that is your product, how you present it means everything in this business. Once you have these fundamentals kind of in the back of your mind and you look through that lens at everything that you are going to go through in the future, you need to take into consideration what the owner's responsibilities are going to be. And you have to kind of do it in a systematic way. The things that the owner has to think about ahead of time are what their goals are, what their personal participation is going to be, and they need to think about the financial and time commitments that they are going to make. And then finally, they have to figure out how they are going to go through the process of selecting the team that's going to help them create this business. People get into self-storage for a lot of reasons. Sometimes they just have a piece of land that they think that self-storage would be a good business for. And so they want to utilize that land in that type of business. Some people are looking for a home that they can have at the same place that the business is. And a lot of times there will be an office apartment at a self-storage facility and they'll want to combine those two in their investment property. Some people get into self-storage just because it's a pretty easy business. I mean, compared to a grocery store or some place that has a lot of turnover in product, self-storage is an easy business. And then there's always the component that self-storage has been an excellent investment straight across the board as far as real estate investments go. Self-storage has a very high history of performance. So investors want to get into it, as well as people that have a more personal agenda for what they want to do with their self-storage business. 
when you're getting into the self-storage business as an owner, you have a number of different ways that you can participate in the business. You can be a participating partner or a non-participating partner. In a non-participating scenario, basically it's just an investment. In a participating partnership, you are actively involved in the process. You need to be aware of the financial commitment that you are going to have to make and the time commitment that follows along with it. The first thing, of course, is that you have to meet the requirements to get the loan. But there's a lot involved in the cost analysis of a project that some things you might be already aware of and some things will bring to forth a little bit more. But there's entitlements, design, and you have to plan for all of these individual things. And then there are surprises, like the endangered uh, gopher turtle that we found at one of our sites that cost us several thousand dollars to take care of. The time commitment in self-storage uh, depends more so on the entitlement process than anything else. There's time involved in research and all of these elements, but the thing that is going to take the most time, or possibly take the most time, is the entitlement process. During the beginning portion of this time commitment that you are going to make, money is only going out. It isn't until you get the certificate of occupancy when the building can, uh, is approved to go ahead and start leasing units, that money starts coming back in. And there is a lease carry period during which the amount of income that's coming in is not sufficient to cover all of the costs. When you get to that point where the amount of money that's coming in equals all of the costs, that's your break even point, and then after that comes profitability. As you are going through your uh, assessment and evaluation of your project, one of the most important things that you are going to have to do is select the team that you work with. I'm a vendor, I have cross metal buildings, and every vendor at a trade show and all of the people that you talk to, they want to earn your business. They are going to put their best foot forward, just as I would, to try and convince you that I am the person that should get your business. But the truth is, we all have actual different areas of expertise. And facts can be a matter of presentation, so you actually have to investigate what you're being told. Facts are a matter of presentation is kind of an odd statement because you think a fact is a fact. But there are so many facts in self-storage that you have to be sure that you're talking apples to apples in any conversation. And I, I want to give you just a couple of uh, examples here about number facts and services facts so you can understand that when you are talking to vendors, you have to investigate a little bit more than just what you see in their advertising. Um, assume you have a, a site that's just under five acres that's 200,000 square feet. 50,000 of that might be a floodplain, which leaves you 150,000 for your project. 60% of that might be paving and landscaping, and that gives you a footprint and gross square footage of 60,000 square feet. If you take out your hallways and entries, that leaves you with 52,000 square foot net leasable. Net leasable is the number that the bank is interested in. They want to know how many square feet you have that is actually going to generate money to generate your income. If you added a second floor to that, that would increase your gross square footage and your net leasable square footage on the same 60,000 foot footprint. So if I'm a developer and I'm talking to you about how many feet I've developed, am I going to be telling you that 200,000 square foot or am I going to be telling you that 52,000 net leasable? Well, typically what we really do is we do the gross square footage of the building. But there's no law about that. So when you are talking to someone about numbers and you are using those numbers to qualify them as a vendor, you need to discuss with them what those numbers actually mean. The same is true of services. What does development really mean? There are vendors who feel that doing uh, feasibility analysis, feasibility studies like site analysis, market analysis, and economic feasibility are enough to qualify you as a developer. We don't really feel that way. We think you have to do everything listed on this slide to be a developer. But there are people that say that they have developed a 
large number of square feet when actually all they have ever done is, is provide um, documentation and analysis of the site. And that is definitely part of the development process. But when you are talking to people and when you are going to be paying them money for services, you need to find out exactly what they are going to provide. And they need to provide you with answers as well as information. And in order to have accurate answers, you really have to have people with experience that cover the full spectrum of what it is that you are looking for. You need to believe in your team. You have to trust your team because they are going to provide you with knowledge that you don't have. And honorable people do have honest misunderstandings. That's why you have to do this investigation before you buy. And you need to use contracts because contracts define those understandings that you have come to with the people that you have investigated and that you have found out the details of exactly what they are offering you. The second basic question is who am I going to get services from? Who does what? There are basically four elements in any self-storage project. There's the owner, the financer, the developer, and the manager, and we're going to go through them just a little bit. The developer, his job is to determine whether or not that this will be a good business in this location. And then he has to design the project to give you the most bang for your buck so that you can make the most amount of money at that particular site. They have to provide you with the financial information that you will need in order to get your financing, and then they have to actually build the project. The owner can be the developer, or it could be a joint venture project, which means the owner and the developer participate together, or it could be a third party development where the developer basically does all the work and the owner just says, yep, that's what I wanted. The financer provides the funding for the project. They also inspect the project to make sure that the progress of what is being built and what is being done is equal to the payment that they are dispersing for that work. They also review all of the documentation to make sure that their loan and that the owner's investment is protected. The manager is the person who comes in and actually starts making the money for you. Up until the point where the manager comes in, money is going out. After that certificate of occupancy, when the manager comes in, they take over and they start managing your project in order to generate income. The owner can be the manager, or you can hire an employee to be the manager, or there can be third-party management that is done through a contract. So we've identified what the owner needs to know and what the different people do, but now you have to figure out how these two parties are going to interact with each other. But basically how you interact with each other is determined by the goals that the owner has and the level of participation that they want to have. The service providers are going to have some type of legal agreement with the owner. The financer is going to be the loan, and the development scenario is the contract, and in the management scenario it's the contract. But who actually does what is going to depend on the owner's involvement. So what we'll do next is just go through an A to Z of what each participant offers. The financer is going to assess the viability of the investment exactly the same way that you are to determine whether it's a project worth doing. Then they provide the financing, distribute the funds, and protect the owner through documentation. The developer has three basic functions. They have the function of analysis at the beginning of the project, the design of the project, and then the final construction of the project. We're going to talk about each one of these things in the development portion in a little bit more depth because it's very important. The analysis portion determines whether or not your project is viable. The site analysis, which is one of the studies that you need to have done, goes over the actual site itself. It's the jurisdictional requirements for that location. It's also the physical lay of the land and any utilities and anything that are already existing on the land or that you know you're going to have to bring to that site. The market analysis is a group of six studies and we're going to talk about each of these a little bit so that you can have an idea 
of the different areas that they address in determining whether or not this is a good investment. The supply and demand analysis compares the local population to the currently available self-storage product. What that means is how many self-storages are already in the area, what kind of square footage do they offer, and what demand is going to be within your trade area. If it's overbuilt, you don't want to build there. If there's a need, then that's a go for this portion of the analysis. The competitor analysis is the next step. Once you have identified what competitors are in the area, you need to look at them and find out exactly what they offer and the way that they offer it. Because you are going to have to compete with these people and you are going to have to have a facility that is equal to or better than what they offer in order to attract customers. The demographic analysis is the next very important part of what you're going to do. And a demographic analysis just tells all of the characteristics of the people in the area. And the reason that this is important is because these characteristics are going to determine what types of units they would typically rent. And your unit mix is going to determine how much income you can expect to get. Another analysis that is very important is traffic generators. If you have a specific trade area that might not show that there is quite enough demand, if you do a traffic generators study as well and find out that there is a great deal of traffic that goes past your facility, even though they don't live close enough to be in your trade area, but they drive past your facility to get to some specific church, school, business, or attraction, then that is going to increase the demand for your self-storage units. The trade area that we've been talking about is your unique geographic location. The density of population determines the trade area for any particular facility. What I'm saying is that if it's a rural area, people will travel further to come to your facility than if it is a densely populated area. So a trade area will be different sizes depending upon the population that you have and how far people are typically willing to travel to get to your location. The final analysis that needs to be done is the jurisdictional and code compliance analysis. And these are the site-specific regulatory requirements. These are so important because they can take so much time and they can cost so much money. Zoning, utilities, environmental fees, fire requirements, miscellaneous things like school bonds, anything that is site-specific to the location that you have chosen needs to be investigated because it can have a significant impact on the cost of the project. The next thing that we look at after we have analyzed the market is the economic feasibility of the project itself. We know how much demand there's going to be. Now we need to know how much the project is going to cost. The economic feasibility of the project is a number of different studies that tell you what the total cost of the project is going to be. I'll give you an example of just one of these studies with the statement of development cost. All of the items listed here are part of the cost of developing the project. Everything from starting with the land going through the complete development, all of the contingency fees that you need to have for those unexpected things, and the amount of equity that you are going to have to have in order to get the project started. Once you've determined all of these costs, they're put together in a report that tells you what the total of those costs are going to be. And a report of this type is generated for each one of those different elements that we listed earlier. This statement of development costs and the other economic feasibility studies that we do are gathered together in the investment summary, which is a picture of the analysis that we have done. The site analysis, market analysis, and economic feasibility all provide us with decision-making opportunities as to whether or not you want to go forward with the project. Each analysis is an opportunity to make a go or no-go decision as to whether or not this is a viable investment. 
The other thing that these analyses do is provide documentation for investors and financial institutions that you have proven that this is a viable investment. Once we've determined that it is a viable investment, the next development responsibility is design. Now, a certain amount of design has to be done in the beginning process to determine what your potential income is. But after we've decided to go forward with the project, design begins in earnest. The first and most important part of your design is the site plan and unit mix. And the reason that it is the most important part is because it is going to determine your revenue. The site plan determines the best layout for the buildings on the land so that you have the most opportunity to generate income. The unit mix establishes the type of units to have at this location in this facility in accordance with the demographics of the area. People will rent the space that they need. So you have to be sure that the space you are offering is the space that they need. The next portion of design is the construction plans. The construction plans are the blueprint that everyone follows in order to actually create the project. The design team is composed of the architect, civil engineer, structural engineer, mechanical engineers, and the landscape design professional. The ultimate responsibility for all of these disciplines rests with the architect. They also do the site plans and the basic layout of the building. The civil engineer is responsible for everything with regard to the land and the utilities, but not the buildings themselves. The civil engineer is usually hired locally because they are most familiar with all of the codes and restrictions in the area, and the design following from that has to be applicable to all of those codes. The structural engineer is responsible for the strength and integrity of the building. They are the people who determine the materials that can be used and the qualities that those materials have to have. The mechanical engineers are responsible for the air conditioning, HVAC, uh, electrical, plumbing. There can be several mechanical engineers on a project, but usually on a self-storage, it is simple enough that only one mechanical engineer is needed, and they just do all of the different disciplines. The landscaper has to make sure that the final look of the building, as far as the landscaping goes, is in code compliance, and they should also make sure that all of the plants that are used will grow well in that area. They need to be native to your location. The final thing that we talk about with regard to design is renderings. And the reason that they are important is because when you are going through the approval process, you will need to be able to show all of the different committees and individuals that you are working with what your project is going to look like. And this is something that the architect provides, and it's just a visual representation of your project. The final development responsibility is construction. And construction is going to be discussed in three areas, financial accountability, time management, and project management, because each one of these areas is crucial to having a good, efficiently produced project. Financial accountability starts with a systematic plan review to make sure that what you were building is as cost effective as possible. It goes all the way through the process of estimating what the costs are going to be and also includes the draw documents that you are going to be using to be paid for the project as you go along. Other responsibilities in this portion include lien releases, insurance, all of the little things that go along documentation-wise to be sure that all of the laws and regulations involved in the construction of the project are being met and that the bank requirements are being met. Time management is essential to your project. It's essential because time is money. If you remember when we were talking about this, in the beginning portion of the project, all of the money is going out. And you don't start getting money until you get that C of O, Certificate of Occupancy, and that is when money starts coming in. So the longer your project takes to get to that point where you have a Certificate of Occupancy, the more it's going to cost. The only way to effectively manage time is to have a system of schedules. The approvals process can be very lengthy and very time consuming, and you can be called back and things can be rescheduled. So you really have to be on top of everything that's happening in the approvals process. In the construction management section, once you've already got your approval, 
all of the different trades have to be scheduled so that they can be working simultaneously rather than having one person complete something and then someone else come in and complete something and then someone else come in and complete something. As you can see from this very small schedule, it's very complicated and time management is one of the most important issues when you are developing your project. The final thing is the project management itself. The project manager who is in charge of making sure that your facility is being built the way that it should be built, is in charge of the entire workforce, making sure that all of the surveys, permits, fees, testing, all of the inspections are being done, and they are the primary person that is in charge of quality control. Work on the project is divided into several different categories, and there may be a number of subcontractors that are working on each category, or one subcontractor may take care of several different categories. It begins at the beginning with the excavation of the land and follows through in each portion of the building all the way through to the signage when you're finished and ready to open. Once construction has been completed, the manager comes in and then the fun begins in earnest. Management responsibilities start with getting the store ready they hire the people, they do the marketing, they are in charge of product sales and services, operations, accounting, and auditing to make sure that your investment is being taken care of the way that it needs to be taken care of. We're going to discuss each one of these just a little bit. When a new store opens, you have to take care of everything from making sure that the utilities are turned on to the offices decorated. You have to have a marketing plan, an advertising plan. The appropriate people have to be hired, and everything with regard to financial setup and sales has to be set in place before you can open the doors. One of the most important things that you will ever do is making the decision on who to put behind the counter. It does not matter whether or not you have the absolute most beautiful facility in the world. If the person behind the counter is not friendly, knowledgeable, and welcoming, you will not get the sale. People's items that they bring into a self-storage facility mean something to them. They would not be paying money to store them if they weren't important. And the person standing behind the counter has to be the person that they are going to feel comfortable entrusting their goods with. They also have to be the person who is aware of all of the legal issues involved in self-storage and can follow the procedures that have to be followed in order to keep you in good standing. Marketing plans are very important. You should have a pre-marketing plan before you ever open the doors. And then you have to do advertising that is appropriate for the demographics in your area. And you cannot neglect the customers that you already have. Once a prospective customer becomes a customer, you still need to take care of them and make sure that they are happy. Product sales and services can add income to the income that you are getting from your units. How it is displayed and the manager's knowledge about the products and services that they offer is very important to the profitability. Facility operations include unit sales and the contracts to get them, customer service, keeping the aesthetic appeal of the facility appropriate, managing the business and managing the property. They also have to be well versed in the accounting systems, the software, the different reports that are generated, and have an understanding of the statistics as people are talking about them. Unit statistics can be expressed in three different ways. They can be expressed as a percentage of unit occupied, the number of units occupied, and the square footage occupied. And this can be three different numbers that people are talking about when they're discussing how profitable your facility is. Square footage occupied is the one that the bank is interested in the most. Auditing is just the process of making sure that all of the financial, procedural, and operational rules and regulations are being followed. And that is the function that management provides to be sure that everything that has been set up and put in place is also audited to be certain that what has been requested is also required.
that's our summary of the essential elements of self-storage. I hope that it has been helpful for you in trying to get an overview of the total process of self-storage. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us through the Contact Us tab on our website. The Param Group also offers additional in-depth lessons in our Learn Self Storage, and we offer consulting, live online training, and contract services.